Hello, everyone. This is Sharon Hoover. I co-direct the National Center for School Mental Health, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar, co-hosted by our National Center for School Mental Health and the School-Based Health Alliance. Our webinar today is titled Multi-Tiered School Mental Health Improvement, Innovation, and Advocacy During COVID-19. And today we'll have a conversation about how our schools and behavioral health systems are responding to COVID-19, including improvements, innovation, and advocacy efforts. I also want to recognize that in addition to the global pandemic, we are confronting several tragedies that have further illuminated the structural racism and inequity in our nation. And we recognize that again, school mental health will be a critical responder during this time. And we're grateful to all of you that even during these times of significant stress, you are all here with us today, rolling up your sleeves to do the work of supporting our children and families. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and share some of our how-tos of Zoom. We recognize that many of us have become more savvy with our online platforms, including Zoom, but just some basics as a refresher. Want to remind you that this training will be recorded and will be made available to participants. Participants will be muted and will not be on video. Our presenters will leave their video on while they are presenting, and then again during the discussion at the end. And we encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions or to provide comments. There is a way that you can send questions or comments specifically to the panelists by selecting all panelists, or you can select all panelists and attendees for your comments or questions to be seen by all. And of note, these questions and comments will be integrated into the discussion toward the end of the webinar. So we will be collecting these as they come in for our speakers, but we will hold them until the end. So feel free to send your questions and comments as speakers are speaking, but just know that we will attend to them at the end. And I also wanna let everybody know that a summary document responding to questions raised will be developed and shared with all registered participants. I want to introduce you briefly to our fantastic lineup of speakers today. I'll give you a brief introduction of each of them as they begin speaking, but you can see here we have a group of well-seasoned folks who are going to be sharing with you their landscape of improvement and innovation as well as some advocacy efforts that have been happening across multi-tiered systems of school mental health support. And I want to acknowledge Katie Stinchfield from the School-Based Health Alliance, who will co-facilitate today's webinar with me. We want to mention that the work that we are sharing today is part of a webinar series that is all under the umbrella of our National Quality Initiative on School Health Services. This initiative is a multi-year initiative funded out of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, and specifically out of the Maternal Child Health Bureau. As you can see here, our National Quality Initiative challenges comprehensive school-based health centers and school mental health systems to adopt, report, and improve standardized uh, performance measures. And this is really all in an effort to improve and increase uh, access to high quality school health and mental health supports for students. We do want to make note of some of the resources of each of our respective organizations. On each of our websites, we have a dedicated space for COVID resources. You can see here on our National Center for School Mental Health site, which you can find at schoolmentalhealth.org, we have a page dedicated to COVID-19 resources that is organized by topic area and also by audience. And uh, some of the resources that you'll hear about today, you can find there. I'm gonna pass it to Katie for a moment to share some of the resources from the School-Based Health Alliance. Thanks so much, Sharon. We're so happy to partner with the center and, and so thankful to all these speakers for being here today. As Sharon said, we have tons of COVID-19 resources on our webpage, as well as general school-based health care resources. Um, check it out for uh, our statement on COVID-19, federal state policy changes, resources for school health and school personnel. Uh, we're also hosting listening and learning sessions, as well as several different webinar series. So please check it out for any resources you can use. And thanks again, everyone, for being here.
Sharon, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. And I'm now delighted to introduce everybody to our first speaker for today. He'll be speaking to us about some of the innovations at Tier 1, the universal mental health promotion tier of our multi-tiered system of support. John Crocker is the Director of School Mental Health and Behavioral Services at Methuen Public Schools and has worked in public education for over a decade. Uh, he's charged with overseeing the district-wide implementation and evaluation of Methuen's comprehensive school mental health system and positive behavior interventions and supports, or PBIS, and is focused on developing a district-wide system of universal mental health screening, advancing the use of psychosocial data to inform school mental health staff's therapeutic practice, and scaling up the use of evidence-based therapeutic services across Methuen. Mr. Crocker founded the Massachusetts School Mental Health Consortium, or MASMIC, a group of approximately 130 school districts across Massachusetts committed to advocating for and implementing quality and sustainable school mental health services and supports. So take it away, John. Okay, here we go. Hi everyone, so happy to be here today to, uh, to present on tier one and some of the approaches that we've used in Massachusetts. Um, I wanted to just frame this problem uh, relative to COVID-19 and what we're experiencing. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of clamoring from our families to be able to get further supports in the home. I know people are balancing work from home, they're balancing uh, attempts to engage in remote learning. So one of the things that I feel like is worth pointing out is that um, within any MTSS, extending the supports into the home is incredibly important. We want to do that when we're in session, but now it becomes uh, an incredibly uh, a necessary component of our day-to-day -day life. So today I'm going to talk to you about some of the ways in which we've translated the practices that we would see in the classroom into um, uh, uh, methods for implementing those uh, practices at home. So as I mentioned, we've got overwhelmed fa uh, families, overwhelmed parents, finding it hard to balance. I think that uh, one of the things that is gonna be a common theme as we continue this work is that our role has really shifted into one of coaches and consultants. We need to resource our families. We need to show them what these practices look like and also adapt these practices such that they work in the home, which is no easy task, but I think that if we, if we focus our efforts on ensuring that we are um, speaking the language that is um, easy to understand for our families, not using a lot of jargon, that we're uh, adapting our practices in a way that makes sense for families, then I think we can, we can make this happen. Essentially what we're talking about is really guiding families to structure their lives in a way that's going to be amenable to remote learning and to working from home at the same time. In order to do this, I think we need to look for some easy wins, right? You know, we hear from our families, we hear from our students what they need, and much of that centers around some of the social determinants of health that we're um, becoming more and more familiar with. Um, we know that managing behaviors, managing learning, managing the emotional needs of students is becoming something that families are relied on to do uh, explicitly. There, there is no support system that is front and center in the home, save for the parents of these students. So we need to ensure that they're resourced, that they can ask questions of us uh, in a way that's going to foster their understanding of these practices in the home. So how does this look? I think we need to make this really easy for families. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about things like PBIS and universal de design for learning and SEL and trauma sensitive schools, I think that we need to boil all of those things down to practices that make sense in the home. We identify what parents need. We identify what students need in the home. We have to translate those practices, innovate in a way um, make them make sense for the home environment, and then ultimately provide the coaching and consultation necessary to ensure that this, this implementation in the home sticks, that we have supported it uh, in a way that will allow for it to uh, 
um, make the home environment a, a, a more effective place for learning and for work. This is a very simple example of an adaptation of PBIS um, in the home. So ultimately, uh, our, our students, our families, they don't know how to instinctively do the remote learning thing. They don't know how to balance these things. We need to explicitly teach our students and our families um, how to navigate this new environment. And one of the ways in which we do that is we explicitly teach behavioral expectations. In the classroom, in schools, we would explicitly teach behavioral expectations using uh, the behavioral expectations matrix or diagrams that we use across uh, different learning spaces. This can be adapted for the home. This is something we can teach parents how to do. And we have to instill in our parents the same sense of understanding that we instill in our teaching staff, which is that uh, students don't instinctively know what the behavioral expectations are. We need to teach those expectations, and then we need to positively reinforce when students meet those expectations. So adapting something that is uh, used in the school, right, a, a poster or a diagram, translating it to, a, uh, to the home environment, um, setting up a home expectations matrix, I'm fully aware of the kinds of uh, pushback that you would uh, experience when using this with perhaps an adolescent. Um, so maybe you're not going to put up the you know, best expectations for a student in high school. But at the same time, all students need to understand what the behavioral expectations are. All students need to be guided through uh, how to navigate this new situation. So whether it's developing a home expectations matrix that is context specific across your home, or having candid conversations with students who are perhaps uh, a little bit older about how to successfully navigate this, what the expectations are related to technology and remote learning, and you know, setting up some just uh, comfortable, uh, comfortable ways of understanding how to, to make remote learning happen. Another uh, key piece to uh, fostering tier one in the home is just simply establishing a routine and schedule. Again, um, predictability and normalcy for students is something that they absolutely need during this time. We have pulled the, the carpet out from under them and their predictability is no longer, you know, so establishing a new normal is something that can very easily be um, fostered, but we need to, again, teach students what that new normal looks like having a daily schedule that can guide some of the um, some of the decisions that students make but also having a little bit of flexibility built in uh, maybe during the academic academic time in the morning you provide uh, some flexibility around you can you can engage in this activity or that activity that choice is yours but this is time where you're going to be engaging in work uh, related to uh, academics um, ultimately, some of our younger kids need visual cues to be able to understand what the day looks like. They, they used to have that in the school setting. They don't have that anymore. So creating that for your family might be something that would, would help. Um, also, we're talking about um, establishing a routine and schedule, not just to get through the day and to have some semblance of normalcy, but also because it alleviates that concern, that anxiety. It's one less thing that they have to um, guess at as they navigate COVID-19. One of the, um, oh, there we go. Um, provisioning students, making sure that they have what they need to engage in remote learning is also an important piece. Again, school, uh, students and parents don't instinctively know how to set up a school in their home. so guiding them, coaching them, consulting them around what the requirements are to successfully navigate remote learning. Is there a physical space? Do you have a plan for technology? Is the location free of distractions? But can you still monitor your students as they engage in these activities? These are all considerations for how to, um, how to engage in that coaching and consultation effectively. I did want to um, just put out there this idea of cognitive coping for families. Ultimately, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm not going to go through this full exercise, but, you know, talking to your students about how, or talking to your children about how they think and feel and behave, their actions and the consequences associated with, the, with those actions, 
that's good parenting, right? That's fostering rational and um, that's fostering rational thinking. That's fostering an understanding of cause and consequence. Um, I think that parents instinctively know how to do this, but they can be talked through how to, to make it even more effective. So the idea here is that we need to give parents the language and the justification for engaging in conversations with their, with their son or daughter around uh, thinking traps, around challenging automatic thoughts. I think, um, uh, next slide, because I think I'm running up on time here. Um, one of the exercises I think is particularly important is to, um, to challenge the automatic thoughts that are associated with COVID-19. And I hear this one an awful lot, sadly, you know, I'm definitely going to get the coronavirus and so will my whole family. If we give parents the uh, opportunity to talk to their son or daughter about this in a way that is going to challenge that automatic thought and, and uh, lead to more balanced and rational thinking, it's going to result in uh, students feeling better. Ultimately, we need to weigh out the evidence. We need to provide some understanding about whether or not there's any uh, rationality behind that statement. Simple cognitive coping can be taught. You know, this is something I would never ask a, a parent to, uh, to engage in full out cognitive behavioral therapy, but I think that uh, helping parents to translate a thought um, that is automatic to a more uh, balanced, rational thought, um, such as not everyone gets COVID-19 and many who do get better, and that our family's taking precautions. Um, so that to me feels like a, um, a better way to um, ultimately help parents to understand how to engage in conversations with their, their students. We can't, um, we ultimately can't speak in hushed tones about this. We need to speak about it rationally and we need to provide families with the knowledge necessary to be able to navigate these situations on their own. And simple cognitive coping is one way of doing that. Next slide. Ultimately, um, I offer this, uh, this guide that was developed in Methuen, um, the Trauma-Sensitive Classroom Strategy Guide. And the idea here is that um, we can translate trauma-sensitive practices into the home. Um, I think we have to be sensitive to how we communicate that. We don't want to um, presuppose that trauma is happening in the home. I think we need to couch it in a discussion about this experience may be traumatizing. Here, here are ways in which you can isolate your uh, or insulate your student from uh, further re-traumatization. And a simple example from this, um, this manual, um, we took physical safety, a, a standard that we wanted to foster within the classroom, and we adapted it all the, uh, everything in red is an addition that we would make for the COVID-19 context and also for the home. So just understanding that these, the idea of trauma sensitive classrooms can be applied in the home with a, a, a very uh, small amount of tweaking. I think lastly, I just want to ensure that people understand that um, fostering SEL in the home, especially during COVID-19 is absolutely doable. Um, uh, I want to send a special thanks to SEL for Mass for pointing us to this resource. One very quick example that hits on a, a castle competency is uh, responsible decision making, and especially with our adolescent students that may be tempted to um, to engage in uh, a lack of social distancing. Um, you know, they they recognize that this is not a virus that impacts adolescents in a way that is very dangerous. But to understand the implications of those decisions and how it might impact other family members or members of the community. So using, using the, um, the idea of um, your impact on others is a way to foster social emotional confidence to help students to understand how to identify and analyze a problem and how to ultimately generate a solution that won't impact others in a negative way. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you so much, John. Very much appreciate your insights and all of the excellent work across Massachusetts and beyond uh, to translate some of our universal school mental health approaches into the home and support families in a coaching model. So we're gonna continue with our tier one theme. And I do want to acknowledge we've had some questions come into the chat box. Please keep them coming. We are gathering them and we'll present them to our 
speakers at the end of today's webinar so that they can share out loud uh, their responses with the group. And we had a few requests during John's talk uh, about the resources that were in the slides. So not only will we be sharing the slides with everyone, we're also going to be sharing some of the resources in a compiled document afterwards. And we'll try to share some in the chat box today as well. So now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jennifer Yuli Wells. Each year, Dr. Jennifer Yuli Wells trains thousands of educators, young people, families, and community providers on a variety of school mental health topics. In 2013, she founded Please Pass the Love Youth Mental Health Initiative, which provides systemic training and support for thousands of educators, schools, and districts across the Midwest, while hosting the only school mental health conference in the state. In 2019, she launched the Iowa School Mental Health Alliance, an active stakeholder group with hundreds of leaders. In 2018, she launched an online school mental health program in collaboration with Drake University. She actively engages in national school mental health capacities, including the National School Mental Health State Summit with leaders of federal agencies, uh, including SAMHSA, HHS, HRSA, DOE, DOJ, and the University of Maryland Center for School Mental Health. She's a member of School Mental Health Communities of Practice and the National Family School Community Alliance with scholars from across the nation. She works for, the Drake, for Drake University as an adjunct professor and her research focuses on racial cultural trauma, self-care and creating sustainable school mental health systems. So welcome uh, Dr. Yuli Wells and we look forward to what you have to share with us today. Well, thanks for having me and John, that was an exceptional, lots of great content in that. Uh, so I like to call this build the tier one plane as we fly through COVID. The reason is, is I, I think we could all agree and I love this imagery that if we look back six months where we were, for me personally and a lot of the people in schools and families that I work with, our reality was not on the radar that it is now and we didn't realize exactly the impact of change. So one of the things that I think is really critical is wherever you're sitting right now, and lots of us have had discussions about feeling exhausted, feeling emotional, feeling uh, one day okay, and maybe next the not, and there's just so many uncertainties. So wherever you're at is absolutely normal and very acceptable in terms of especially the professional work we're doing. Kids and school mental health systems and schools and families were struggling and vulnerable before and they're even more so now. Um, so uh, to be honest with you, I don't know if this is already a model somewhere, but this is within our entities how um, we have really created a, a visual to help people think about as we head forth, yes, our students are an absolute priority, but we also have to give space to our families and to our staff. And so when we think about that, sometimes it's easier when we think concretely of, hey, I know I have some staff that maybe are struggling and I know other colleagues in this webinar are gonna talk about some tier two and tier three interventions, but I really wanna make sure that we're all just thinking about, when we think about folks that might be struggling or not struggling in our prevention at our tier one, we really have to think across the board of all entities that are working with schools on top of um, our students. So as an agency, we serve, um, we're in Iowa, but we serve across the Midwest. And so a lot of what we've done as we rapidly tried to pivot, how do we make this work, work in a virtual world? A lot of what we've done is educational. So we have a lot of virtual programming. Um, we quickly created some COVID mental health relief programming for um, not just the families we work with, but the students and the staff. One of the things that I think is really critical that we keep in mind as we head forth though, is that you don't have to have all the answers, especially when we're talking about um, tier one prevention universal strategies. One of the pieces that's really critical and a huge return on investment is figuring out who in your networks has those answers. Right now, we know that as we've all been pivoting rapidly, we didn't plan, this wasn't in a strategic plan from a year ago or two years ago or six months ago 
to know that we were going to have to be there. So the, the likelihood of us all being able to reinvent a wheel is very slim. So look out to your networks, put investment in collaborations, because if you don't have something, odds are other entities do. So whether that's the county, whether that's the state, whether that's neighboring districts, community organizations, they're going to be really critical in the work, not just now, but through fall too, because we don't know what the trajectory on this looks like, right? We don't have an end date. And so we want to make sure we're building our system and our capacities now, especially over the summer while we can. So I really want to drive home the summer piece. I know that a lot of our systems, including our students and our staff, have either gone to summer break, some are on their way to going to summer break, some have different schedules that will impact their summer, some are year-round schools, and I recognize all of that. I think, though, as we dive into talking about um, summer, we have to use, use as much of it as we can. And I think when we talk about our students, we're providing a variety of educational opportunities. But I think that schools, when we think about interconnected systems framework and expanded school mental health, we all have some buy-in here, right? And when we talk about um, what students are needing over the summer, we, one of the worst things we could do is just walk away into summer and have no contact with them and then pick up um, in fall, whatever day that is, whatever that looks like, and just hope for the best. So we really want to take advantage of the summer um, in your entities. We want to be offering education for students. We want to be offering resource for students. We want to offer opportunities for them to connect virtually or safely in person. And I know each state is in a different um, you know, returning to face-to-face uh, -face types of situations. Some states are still in shelter in place, but that ability to connect is really critical. We've been working with schools and encouraging them if they provide technology during the school year not to take it back over the summer. Some of our students, that's their only ability to access resources and connections over the summer, and so we want them to have those access to mental health professionals sometimes low-hanging fruit can just be making sure that we're pushing out both our students and families some of those basic resources that are available whether it's um, telehealth whether it's local agencies that are providing some mental health supports if we do not provide those resources to students the odds of them locating them on their own diminish greatly um, the fourth bullet point, and I think this is a, a real concern for all of us, is what about families and, and students that are in um, situations that aren't healthy and they're dangerous and making sure that they have access to the outside world. And I'll be honest, this is something that our teams and our networks across our state, there's not on our end a perfect, well-polished answer. I don't know that there ever is, but that's something that we really want to keep in mind is that um, child abuse reports, domestic violence, and that those that have to be shelter in place and homes that don't have access to some of the resources that they normally have access to, um, that we're looking at those opportunities and trying to build that. Again, we're building the plane as we fly. One thing we want to be mindful of is multilingual programming so that all of our students have access to resources too. Um, not just some of our uh, ch chosen, you know, dominant culture, English speaking white families. And then we have on our end, we have some amazing students that have decided to create some mental health um, programming um, force for families and students. Um, so for staff, I think this is one of the biggest things just want to make sure I'm not running out of time here. Um, one of the biggest things is our staff healing, 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 healing over the summer. Uh, we don't want our staff to just walk away over the summer and we say, good luck, hope it works out, see you in the fall. We really want to make sure that as systems, we're embedding high levels of self-care, we're modeling that culture, we're really creating it, we're tapping in with those staff, and not just teachers and not just school counselors. We're tapping into bus drivers, nutrition specialists, before and after school folks, because we really want to make sure 
sure that everybody's okay. And we wanna make sure that they have access to educational opportunities. We're providing a variety of them, but then we also wanna make sure their basic needs and their mental health needs are met too. And then families. Uh, families really are what are making the world go around for their, their young people right now. We have a lot of families hurting. Um, financial strain situations, relational strains, getting basic needs met, such as food on the table, housing. Um, in our states and in our some of our local neighboring states, some of those protections that were in place in terms of evictions and a variety of other protections have now been removed. And so we're seeing all sorts of shifts for families. We wanna be strategic, right? It's about working smarter, not harder. So what other entities are there in my region that as a school, I can make sure that I'm continually pushing out to families, whether that's in websites, emails, texts, if we don't provide that information, sometimes we assume that families have the resources to navigate, navigate that on their own. And that includes mental health, that includes self-care, and so we wanna ramp up that communication. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Again, we always appreciate your insights and the tremendous work that you're doing. Uh, I want to remind people that you can access the resources uh, of our speakers in a document that we'll share after today's webinar with all registered participants. And you've already heard about a number of resources that hopefully you'll be able to put into practice either right now over the summer or in the upcoming school year. So we're going to shift up our multi-tiered system of support a bit to talk about improvements and innovations in the areas of tiers two and three supports in our school mental health continuum. And first we're going to hear from Dr. Tali Raviv. Dr. Raviv is a child clinical psychologist at the Center for Childhood Resilience at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, whose work focuses on the implementation and dissemination of evidence-based mental health interventions to school and community settings. As schools have shifted to remote learning due to COVID-19, school mental health providers have been faced with new challenges to providing tier two and tier three services. And at the same time, the shift to remote service delivery provides opportunities for creativity, innovation, and increased engagement with families. And Dr. Raviv will highlight some strategies that can be used during remote learning with examples drawn from the work of clinicians and districts across Illinois. Dr. Raviv will discuss ways to leverage successes and lessons learned to drive improvements in school mental health delivery into the future. So welcome Dr. Raviv and we look forward to hearing your wisdom. Thank you. I'm happy to be part of this um, webinar today. It is really so gratifying to connect with colleagues across the country and I think that that has really been one of the um, silver linings of this situation for me is the opportunities really to, um, as Jennifer said, not to, re and not to do this alone really, to, to, to reach out across and see what other people are doing and the innovative work that's happening. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit. I don't think we need to say very much about the mental health challenges that are arising both from the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously, and the social unrest um, happening in communities across our country um, as people are exposed to the structural racism and the you know, generations really of the struggle that are really coming to a head right now. Um, so that need is really all around us. Um, we know that the mental health need is compounded by exposure to um, additional stresses, collective trauma and individual trauma, and of course, by the lack of um, connection um, to community resources and to other support systems that are naturally occurring in, in children's lives, including um, the education system. So we, those challenges are there, and there's also certainly the service delivery challenges related to COVID-19 specifically. I think in the early days of the pandemic, I was listening to a lot of districts grappling with how do we do this remotely? How do we maintain consent, privacy, confidentiality? How do we ensure that students are safe um, through these virtual platforms? What are our new crisis protocols? How can we even um, establish uh, crisis procedures and re revise the ones that we had in the schools? 
Um, we know about the digital divide and that um, there's technology access and in our rural communities, Wi-Fi, um, urban communities as well. There's not always access to um, the, the connectivity. We also have to think about the providers, right? The providers here are not only um, struggling with their own emotional and, um, and uh, stress reactions, but also, of course, trying to balance their multiple roles, often as caregivers or caretakers for others, um, as well as their, their job. But then on top of that, we have varying levels of knowledge, comfort, and sense of competence with these kind of telemental health or other online platforms. Um, we're seeing, obviously, barriers to collaboration within school building and disrupted relationships. Um, we, we have heard a lot about fear and concern about those students, the, the very students that we cannot reach and that we have the most concern about. But I would argue that um, this is the time to look at the very real opportunities that the pandemic offers. And so while it's true that crisis sometimes can make it hard to really embrace new practices and be flexible in our thinking, it's also true that there are a lot of opportunities that crisis kind of can highlight. And so I would say um, one of the biggest things that I have really been heartened by is the increased awareness at all levels, and I'll talk about the advocacy piece in a little bit, but at all levels, um, from the individual student and the individual family to the building administrators to the district level and the state boards of education about the need for a comprehensive approach to uh, school mental health and to find alternatives to traditional service delivery. So right now in this moment, I think nobody can argue that mental health and wellness and trauma are things that, and inequities in our society are things that we must address and grapple with. And so that awareness means that we already, a big part of our work in building that awareness and building the case is kind of taken down um, off of our list. And so we have opportunities now to listen to community and youth voices in ways um, as as they're able to tell us what is what is the need, what is working for them, and what is not. Um, as um, was pointed out earlier by, by John, you know, there is an, a new role here to consult to staff and to consult with parents, and they are asking for it, they are thirsty for it, and, and so again, we're, we're no longer in the situation where I can kind of talk about the importance and people are focused elsewhere. I think people are really focused right now on the need for mental health. Um, I also really have been impressed with now that we have broken down this barrier of I'm in my school building during these hours, there are a lot of opportunities for interdisciplinary cross school and cross agency collaboration as we are able to do that remotely, um, as well as peer consultation um, support and supervision. So we've been able to host um, you know, these kinds of Zoom calls for clinicians across schools within the same district and they have learned from one another um, and supported one another. And so it's really a time that we can have professional growth. Um, I think there's also opportunities for students and families. So here below, you see a couple things that um, I'll talk about in a minute, but technology can increase engagement, novelty, and fun of these tier two and tier three interventions. So on the, on the uh, bottom of the screen, you see a Bitmoji classroom. So for those of you who have not seen that, um, I think we've learned a lot from our educator colleagues um, about how to set up these types of interactive, engaging um, environments that can be used for groups. Um, on the other side here, you see um, a Pear Deck. Um, for people who haven't heard of those, that is um, another um, add-on to Google Slides where you can actually do a slideshow and have interactive questions. And so here's one. Um, that is a stress check. You know, you can, in real time, if you're convening a group of students for a tier two service, you can ask them about their stress level kind of in real time and then look at their, their results. Um, there's opportunities to use technologies to reinforce and generalize skills outside of the face-to-face -face interaction. There's apps and reminders and other um, technological ways that we can really use um, technology to our advantage to kind of be those generalization agents outside of our time in individual or group time with students. I really also have been struck by um, the fact that in many ways for many families there are reduced barriers to caregiver involvement in school-based services and that's partly because 
of course they are the educators in some ways now, right? But, um, you know, I have, families are now joining IEP meetings through video conference. And so imagine if that's carried forward, you no longer will have to take families having to have transportation barriers or take time off of work in order to come in and travel to the school for those kinds of meetings, but you're able to connect with them either virtually um, or through, um, you know, other types of technology with messaging. Um, so I wanted to also highlight a couple other innovations in tier, the tier two and tier three world that I have heard about. So in my role at um, the Lurie Children's Hospital Center for Childhood Resilience, we have the privilege of really supporting multiple districts across Illinois and clinicians who are implementing tier two um, or tier three services and evidence-based interventions. And so I've learned so much from the kind of innovative and um, creative, dedicated professionals um, and so one of, you know, and we've already talked about some of these things, but um, we've had lots of people do um, sharing videos or read alouds on the screen, um, you know, even finding books that are relevant. Um, I just had a, a, somebody send me yesterday, um, there's a lovely read aloud for children um, called something, I think it's something happened in our town. And it's really about civil unrest and police brutality, and it's an animated read aloud. And so that's what a wonderful thing to share and then discuss with students. Um, if you haven't heard about Close Gap, it's a free um, website. It'll be on my resource slide in a minute, but it allows groups of uh, teachers can do it with a classroom or you can do it with a group, um, with a group in your own um, tier two group if you have one. Um, and it's a daily check-in where they can look at their emotional state as well as their energy level. And then you can monitor that over time. And it's a really nice way to connect with students in between groups. Um, we also have um, online games like Uno, Checkers, or Chess, you know, those kind of old standbys that you do to engage students when you're working with them one-on-one -on -one in your office. Um, those can be done online and can be done virtually. There are ways to jointly create artwork um, or documents or other kinds of things that you can work on together to improve that engagement and collaboration and services. Um, I also heard about um, a couple people who have put together a virtual calming room so for their district and that virtual calming room has different, it's um, almost like a Google Classroom and it's got you know, a different tab for apps or coloring pages, those meditative coloring pages, yoga, mindfulness, even live animal cameras, um, to really look at whatever is working for, for that particular student, they can choose what kind of calming activity they would like. Um, we've seen a lot of innovation on conducting cognitive behavioral therapy virtually. So we've seen um, tip sheets on how to do behavioral activation during social distancing, how to do social exposures, um, for kids with social anxiety during social distancing. So how to modify those key components of cognitive behavioral therapy for use virtually. Um, a big um, thing that I've heard a lot mentioned here is really the ability to bring parents into the effort more. And parents are really looking for strategies for um, tier, tier two and tier three. How do I reinforce the skills? How do I manage my child's anxiety at home? How do I manage my child's behavior? And so whatever the child is learning, what else can parents do to generalize and reinforce that information at home? Finally, a, another really um, fantastic thing is I've really seen a lot of information sharing um, with schools. And so clinicians is kind of crosses across tier one, tier two, and tier three, but how can we share information with our school communities through um, newsletters that go out to caregivers, that go out to educators, that go out to the school, um, shared workspaces, um, virtual, obviously. And I wanna also point out that especially for those hard to engage families or for families that may not have all the access to technology, there are a lot of innovative ways to, um, even in this time that we've been socially dis distant and disconnected from some um, community organizations and institutions like um, the faith community, there are ways to use community spaces like grocery stores and food pantries, et cetera, to really reach out and, and share messages that are important for families to hear of how to, how to access support for um, mental health uh, concerns and challenges. And so really thinking outside the box of where, do, where are people going and how can we share our messages? 
Um, I'm going to just highlight quickly, and this will be, of course, as you heard, you'll, you'll get these materials um, afterwards, but um, I want to say and shout out to our colleagues at Chicago Public Schools. We work with them really closely. They have set up an amazing resource and um, about SEL during remote learning, and it is open to the public. So that's here. Our Center for Childhood Resilience has a COVID-19 resource page, and we have some guidance for how to think about should you start a tier two group, what are some um, considerations, and so that's available. Some of the other um, resources I mentioned here, um, guidance for um, tier two trauma groups and psychological first aid are available from our colleagues at traumaelderschools.org, the developers of the CBITS and bounce back interventions, as well as um, psychological first aid listen protect connect, which we use a lot here in Illinois. Um, the Facing History and Ourselves has amazing um, lesson plans. There's also a lot of other resources that are increasingly coming out now in response to the current situation and the um, structural racism. How do we talk to students? How do we take care of ourselves and our colleagues during this time? Um, so um, these will be available and I'm happy to take questions. I'll, I'll pop on in a little while to talk a little bit about how we can leverage this into advocacy. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tali. We greatly appreciate all of the resources and your experiences in Illinois and beyond, and I know they'll be helpful for, for our participants today. We're seeing great questions come in to our Q&A box and our chat box, and we're compiling those to try to address at the end of today's webinar, so keep those coming in. And we are compiling a list of resources and the PowerPoint to share afterwards. So to continue our tier two, tier three discussion, I'd like to introduce to you Paul Reinert. Paul has worked in the Boston area with children, their families and their schools for over 30 years. He currently works at the Center for Trauma Care in Schools, CTCS, which is a SAMHSA funded program of the Alliance for Inclusion and Prevention in Boston, Massachusetts. CTCS works with Massachusetts schools and districts to improve access to evidence-based services for students experiencing traumatic stress and staff training to support school and district efforts to become trauma responsive. Paul is a trained trainer in the Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Trauma in Schools, CBITS, and supporting transition resilience of newcomer groups, STRONG, two group treatment models to treat traumatic stress, as well as a certified national trainer in the Olveus Bullying Prevention Program. CTCS, along with Lurie Children's Center, where Tali uh, resides, will be project partners on a newly awarded uh, National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative Award to the National Center for School Mental Health. So welcome, Paul. We look forward to hearing your remarks about tiers two and three. Um, thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking with all of you today. Uh, my colleagues and I, um, we had been doing in-person trainings in a variety of evidence-based practices that were all to be delivered in schools to students who were experiencing traumatic stress. And that obviously came to an abrupt halt when schools were closed and clinicians were thrown into telehealth. Um, and I'm going to be talking about an online adaptation of CBITS called CBITS Online Live that uh, is delivered as a synchronous online group. Now, I'll give a description of the model and then speak about some implementation considerations related to online service delivery. Um, but first, since the focus of this webinar is about MTSS and COVID-19, I did want to start by talking about how CBITS Online fits with systems of support. <clears throat> and I know for those of you familiar with MTSS, you are probably expecting to see a triangle um, and not circles. Um, but if you haven't seen this school-wide PBIS graphic by George Sagai and others, um, to me it's really important. Um, as important as that uh, three-colored triangle is when we think about MTSS, and it shows the overall structure of how MTSS works school-wide to change adult behavior so that we can more effectively support students. And this is the purpose of MTSS to change what we as adults are doing in our schools and districts in order to allow students to be able to achieve positive outcomes academically and socially and emotionally. Um, you can see systems are put in place um, that help to support the implementation of evidence-based practices. And most importantly of all, that data is used to drive all the decision-making throughout the process. 
And as I said, we had system, the systems that we had uh, that supported trainings and school-based delivery of evidence-based practices quickly became quite obsolete. And many of the first contacts we received after the stay-at-home order uh, was put in place here were from clinicians who had already started running groups in their schools and who wanted to know what they should be doing online um, with these students. And so this was an urgent need for us to give clinicians a tool that they could use immediately um, during the remainder of the school year. Um, even though there was also this larger systemic need to totally reorganize and replace our in-person trainings and service delivery with a more flexible online and in-person system of training and intervention, and to be gathering data about how these systems and interventions might work. And what we ended up doing was to form a focus group of a small number of high school students and delivered an online adaptation of CBITS to them. And the students gave us immediate feedback as well um, as survey information responding to specific questions about how enjoyable, how understandable, and how engaging the material was when it was delivered online. We provide the material based on their feedback, and now a few clinicians are piloting it in Massachusetts, and we'll be getting additional feedback from the clinicians about the ease of use and their perception of student engagement. And the next steps that will address the logistics of training clinicians in the online model, that's still in production at this point. Um, this is the scope and sequence of CBITS online, line, online Live. For those of you already familiar with CBITS, you, you can see that it follows the CBT skill building activities exactly. Psychoeducation, self-regulation skill building, thought restructuring and social problem solving are all included in the six sessions. And what's not included are the group sessions related to trauma narratives and to exposure. And this is, is not meant to imply that these can't be uh, delivered online. Um, just an acknowledgement that uh, issues of privacy and confidentiality are much different online and that the group format uh, isn't recommended for delivery of those specific components. The sessions are intended to be delivered uh, within 30 to 40 minutes each, can be delivered once weekly or twice weekly. Um, the, URL, the URL for the curriculum is listed at the bottom where it's posted on the CBITS website at cbitsprogram.org um, in the COVID-19 tab there as a guidance document. It has overall guidance about online treatment with the CBITS online live curriculum as an attachment, as well as additional guidance related to engaging students online from the folks at the Project Fleur de Lis at the Mercy Family Center in New Orleans, and also an online curriculum for delivering Bounce Back, um, the version of CBITS for elementary age students that was developed by the folks at Center for Childhood Resilience at the Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. I want uh, to briefly share some thoughts about implementation that relate to MTSS, uh, to student engagement and to workforce development. And CBITS groups have historically been associated with tiers two and three, but there's now a greater need for skill building instruction uh, like in CBITS Online Live universally. And we risk overburdening school counselors and social workers and psychologists if we are assuming that they alone are responsible for addressing what's now a pretty much a universal need. Um, and we can expect that schools and districts are going to be requesting a greater number of SEL resources that can be delivered uh, by teachers and school staff to develop a solid uh, tier one foundation in a universal way. But in terms of tiers two and three, uh, systems need to be in place to identify students whose, uh, whose needs rise to levels of significant traumatic stress. Um, and this screening will increasingly be needed online um, as well as in person. Uh, training and supervision need to be in place to support evidence-based practices, both in person and online to treat traumatic stress. A uh, system is needed to incorporate the trauma narratives and exposure through an individual format, whether that's delivered in person or online as a supplement to skill building groups, such as see if it's online live. And Related to uh, student engagement, uh, students in our focus group reported that student engagement was the primary consideration when they were talking with us about their experience with online education in general, as well as their experience with our group treatment curriculum. Equity uh, related to access to technology continues to be a major barrier to online service delivery um, and is one more contributor to the opportunity gap that can, currently exists. Um, and there are um, many more 
people who are way more eloquent than me who are speaking out about this issue currently in the context of the protests that are happening now in all of our communities. Um, but suffice it to say that issues of racism and equity have direct consequences on student achievement, as well as the delivery of student supports that promote social and emotional health that, that are here we're focusing on today. Um, related to training and supervision, there is a general lack of resources available to guide clinicians who have been very, very quickly moved to online delivery of services to kids. Um, in addition to resources related to platform use and confidentiality that frequently is all that is available to clinicians, um, they need guidance related to effective student engagement in order to assess, to formulate, to set goals, and to evaluate progress. And supervisors who often have no experience themselves with telehealth need to be able to guide clinicians past relationship maintenance and check-ins toward forward thinking, goal setting, and skill building with students. Um, new and different clinical skills are needed for this new practice format. And we found in our conversations with clinicians that group treatment is tending to have a higher level of student engagement. Um, this is presumably because students are so incredibly starved for contact with their schoolmates uh, during the stay at home orders. Uh, and, un and unfortunately, the current predictions for what school around here is gonna be looking like in the future um, is that there will be some kind of mix of online and in-person uh, training, learning um, that's going to be happening and that staggered school schedules and rolling closures of schools when spikes of infection occur um, is going to most likely necessitate moving back and forth between online and in-person treatment delivery uh, as well as training. And finally, how the pandemic is going to ultimately affect the workforce that delivers services to students is yet to be fully understood. Um, community mental health partner agencies play an important role here in Massachusetts delivering services in schools. Um, most do so primarily through clinicians on a fee-for-service basis and how the system can continue to be feasible moving forward as uh, for both agencies as well as for individual clinicians is an important question that is yet to be answered. And additionally, graduate schools are looking into the extent to which school-based clinicians are going to be able to continue to accept interns into their schools so these workforce development issues have important implications for the school's capacity to be able to provide supports to students. Um, so I uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak about this project um, as we all continue to adjust the new realities of school mental health. Thank you so much, Paul. Again, I uh, really appreciate your experience and recommendations for practice and policy considerations. And just a reminder to everyone, the great resources that were just shared will be in the PowerPoint slides and the resource document, and we can insert some of them into today's chat box as well. We see the questions coming in. We will answer some of them live here in the Q&A box and in the chat box, and we'll also save some time at the end. Now we're gonna move into our advocacy portion of the session today and hear about some advocacy efforts that are occurring or are planned in our effort to support school mental health across the nation. So first we're going to hear from Dr. Kelly Valencourt Strobach, who is a nationally certified school psychologist and currently the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the National Association of School Psychologists. Dr. Strobeck has developed, authored, and co-authored numerous articles and resources, including NASP's Framework for Safe and Successful Schools, and has presented nationally on issues related to school safety, school mental health, effective discipline policies, and the relationship between education policy and school practices. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sherbeck, and we look forward to hearing all about your advocacy efforts at NASP and with your partners. Great, thank you. So um, I wanna spend just a little bit of time um, kind of talking about where we are from a national land, uh, landscape perspective and then share a little bit about some of the advocacy work that NASP and our partners have been doing primarily at the federal level. I think a lot of the issues um, you've already heard a little bit about um, today and some of these may not be new information to you. I think for those of us that work in school mental health, um, we've known a lot of the issues um, that, are, that are currently present and I think the pandemic has really brought them to the forefront um, for a lot of really important policymakers and decision makers. Um, it is an ever-changing conversation, but I've spent a lot of time talking to school psychologists and other mental health providers across the country, as well as 
policymakers and, and decision makers. And some of the themes that have really continued to be major topics of conversation are we know that, you know, Deep, when, deep inequities in access to comprehensive school mental and behavioral health services existed before the pandemic, and they continue to exist. Um, I think this is especially true, as, as um, was mentioned previously, for communities who lack access to technology and lack um, consistent access to internet connectivity. You have heard some of the amazing ways that school districts and providers really quickly pivoted to providing services in a, in a virtual environment. But unfortunately, not all of our students were able to access those. Um, a lot of our school psychologists have noted, and I'm sure this is true across all professions, that for some of our families who had the most need, they had the least amount of access to technology. And so we've struggled with really connecting with some of our neediest, um, some of our neediest families. And again, another thing we've also heard is that there's been inequity in how districts prioritize social emotional learning and mental and behavioral health with school closures. Um, I've spoken to a lot of uh, mental health providers who are also parents, and they've noted that they've received a wealth of information from their, from their teachers and principals and school districts about how to support um, distance learning and the academic piece of, of virtual education, but they got very little guidance um, on how to support students' social emotional learning and how to support their mental health. And as someone mentioned previously, you know, a lot of our parents, they're not equipped to do that for their kids. They're not used to doing that. They're also juggling their own job responsibilities while also trying to make sure they are keeping their kids on some sort of schedule and providing a sense of normalcy for them at home. So we've really seen almost a patchwork um, of services being provided to students. I think we've also really learned, you know, unfortunately, there are still, it's a, small, it's, a, it's a shrinking segment, I think, of, of decision makers um, who think that schools, you know, really their only job is to provide academic um, support for students. We have really seen the fact that schools are a critical conduit for all kinds of social services for our students and families. That has really been made apparent. When the school building shut, the work of the school did not stop. Um, we have seen schools and providers and teachers and educators go above and beyond um, connecting students with, with food, with continued access to healthcare, um, you know, particularly making sure that we are addressing their mental and behavioral health needs. Um, but again, significant disparities exist. And as we look forward to the fall, where it doesn't look like we're going, there's going to be a return to quote unquote normal for quite a while, we need to really think about how we can make sure we're still connecting families to all of those services. No, I really appreciated the mention earlier on it is incredibly important that we are addressing the mental and behavioral health needs of our students, but conversations have really escalated around how we're also supporting the, the mental and behavioral wellness of our staff, um, not just parents and families, but also the mental and behavioral health providers who, you know, we are, we're experiencing collective trauma. Um, some are experiencing it on, you know, everyone's experiencing it at a different level, um, depending on their, their unique situation. But we have to make sure that we are promoting really good care for the caregiver. And so we have been engaged in some conversations with some school districts, um, with some of our national partners around what can schools and districts do to make sure that they're supporting the adults in the building, not just over the summer. I completely agree. I believe it was Jennifer earlier who mentioned that. We need to make sure that we are providing a lot of self-care and opportunity for self-care for our providers and, and teachers over the summer. But also, how are we going to create those support systems when we return to school? How can we make sure that it is okay for staff to acknowledge that they are having a hard time and that they need a mental health break without fear of, of repercussion, um, you know, without fear of losing their job? That it's, you know, as much as we promote it being okay for students to speak up when they, when they need help. We've got to make it safe for adults to do that as well. And I think the most critical thing that, that um, we are all trying to grapple with right now is how we address the shortage of mental health providers. And this goes both for school-employed mental health professionals, so these are your school psychologists, school social workers, school counselors, but also our community providers and our community partners. There was a, a shortage exists before the pandemic happened. And there's significant concern that as we face an economic downturn, 
that the shortage is going to um, it's going to increase even more. And what we're starting to hear more and more of, um, I actually had an email from a university just this morning, is uh, what is sorry, you're probably hearing my toddler in the background. I apologize. <laughs> Um, but some universities are starting to consider closing training programs. So we're really concerned about what that's going to do to the pipeline of providers because as this economic downturn, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a second, it's not just going to impact our K-12 schools. It's certainly going to impact higher education. And what is that going to do to our ability to continue to provide high-quality graduate education opportunities for the wide range of mental and behavioral health professionals that serve our students? So some of the advocacy efforts that we have really been focused on, to be quite honest, it's, it's largely focused on getting more money. Um, there's, you know, depending on which analysis you look at, um, the number of jobs potentially that we could see lost, um, are seven, it's, it's around 750,000. That includes teachers, that includes school psych, school counselors, school social workers. Um, if, if we don't, if Congress doesn't come up with some additional money to fund the education system and to supplement state and local budgets, we really could be facing a significant, um, significant staffing cliff, not just in schools, but also in the communities. And this has really detrimental, potential detrimental downstream effects. So if, if we think about just how, what would happen if we lose just teaching positions, that means we are going to have larger class sizes, it's going to be much more difficult to engage in that really high quality wellness promotion and early intervention work that we really rely on teachers to do. They're already struggling to do that with class sizes of 25. What, if, what is that going to do if we have class sizes of 30 or 35 kids? Um, we're going to be expecting higher caseloads um, for our existing mental health staff, which down the road could mean that schools are forced to only provide services to those kids who are in crisis. Um, we, and, and we worry about this because this is what we saw um, after the 2008-2009 recession. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time really educating key stakeholders on the importance of mental and behavioral health and social emotional learning and, and what that looks like as we, as we look towards a reopening. And they all acknowledge the importance. I have yet to talk to a single principal or superintendent or chief state school officer who doesn't acknowledge that mental and behavioral health is critically important, um, even more so now that we are dealing with a pandemic as well as the, the civil unrest right now as we finally face the systemic racism that happens in our country. But we know from experience that when it comes down to it, when they're sitting there looking at their budgets, unfortunately, mental and behavioral health services are often some of the first to go. And this is absolutely not the time to be cutting access to those services. Um, so I think that we're, we're, we're really concerned about um, the lack of funds that, that could potentially be available to support this work in light of an economic downturn. I think additionally, we have, we've done a lot of work with a lot of partners to address the digital divide. Um, this is important not only just from, a, from an equity writ large standpoint, um, but as we, I think the reality is we are going to be um, in some sort of hybrid model of education as we as we go back in the fall. And so how can we take the lessons that we learned during this first round of school closures and how some students, how there was inequitable access to mental health and telehealth services, what can we do to fix that moving forward so that we do have a level playing field that every student um, who needs to speak with a mental health professional can do that, whether or not it's via a texting platform or Zoom or Facebook or however you feel like you need to connect with a mental health provider. We've got to make sure we're addressing that digital divide um, to make up for the fact that kids aren't going to school every day. And we know that the, by and large, schools are the de facto mental health um, service providers for schools. So we absolutely need to make sure that we are addressing that, that um, digital divide. And again, I think it's, it's no secret to a lot of us that our, our mental and behavioral health system was fragile and some would argue broken before the pandemic and the numbers you know at least from the school-based perspective we are seeing increased rates of suicidality um, I think if you look at some of the the data coming from some of our national suicide prevention hotlines and from the Trevor project which you know focuses on the LGBTQ community 
the number to those call centers are rapidly increasing and we're, we're, over, we're, we're close to being overwhelmed. And again, I think without an infusion of money, and not to say that money is everything, but money is a lot, especially um, when we're thinking about how we really build up these systems, we have to think about how we can protect that. And that's not just on Congress. I think um, we're going to need a, a combination of, of federal money, money from the philanthropic community is equally important. We're gonna to need to rely on our nonprofit community partners to help, to help do this. But I also think now is really a time for um, having serious conversations about mental health reform. And there are slowly members of Congress are starting to think about um, what that might look like. You know, there's a, there's a saying, you know, you don't wanna waste a good crisis. And I think this is an opportunity, you know, we are, we are recognizing a lot of the challenges that exist in our mental health system, and we should take this opportunity to fix that. Um, it's not easy conversations to have, but they, they are happening. Um, which I which I find really really encouraging, and I think you know again this has been addressed a number of times throughout um, throughout this recording so far is that we've absolutely got to think about um, how we are educating the right people. So let's say that we get we can have you get all the money in the world that you need to do this to do this work. We have to convince those who are in charge of spending that money to do the right thing. So we have been doing a lot of work with um, the chief state school officers, with the principals, um, with our school superintendents, uh, state directors of special education, all the folks who really are tasked with, with spending money, whether or not it comes from Congress or whether or not it comes from, from another source, to make sure that they understand that social emotional learning and comprehensive school mental and behavioral health services across all the tiers, because I think we're, we still have a lot of work to do in some places, convincing people that mental and behavioral health doesn't mean just therapy. It doesn't mean just working with those students who are in crisis. It encompasses prevention and promotion and early identification and intervention. So we've been doing a lot of work, um, and particularly a lot of that work is included working with our teachers union. Um, we just released, and I will, I will make sure that all these resources get put in the chat box and get sent to you afterwards. NASA has a ton of resources on how you can help support student mental health during school closures. But we've also started thinking about um, what systems and structures need to be in place as we look towards reopening. And I know our, our friends at NEA and ASP have also started to have those conversations to make sure that when we do reopen the school doors, that we've got systems and structures in place to very quickly um, enhance and improve the services we're providing around student social emotional learning um, and mental and behavioral health because we know those needs are going to be huge. They're huge right now and they're not going to go away um, just because we open our arms the school building doors back. So um, I encourage you to get involved as much as you can. Again, I'll put some more resources um, in the chat box for you. So I think this is a time where we're going to need an all hands on deck situation and we'll need every single one of your voices to make sure that we can make real progress. Thank you so much, Dr. Sturbeck. We greatly appreciate, again, all of the resources that you've shared and the advocacy efforts that you're doing on behalf of all of us. And many of you may be wondering, how can you engage as an activist or an advocate uh, or really kind of um, make change within your own community? And so we wanted to present both uh, some of the resources and efforts at the national, national federal level, but also at local and state levels. And so we encourage you to check out the resources from NASP and our other national partners. And then we're gonna take a few minutes just to hear again from Dr. Rabiv about some of the efforts in uh, the state of Illinois and in some of the local communities there to look through the lens of local activism and advocacy. And um, we, I'm gonna encourage our speakers to begin and continue answering some of the questions that are entered into the Q&A box. We will attend to some of those out loud as well, but we will start typing some of our responses so that uh, we can answer all of the good questions coming in. We'll go ahead and pass it to uh, Tali. Yeah, thank you again. And I am speaking also on behalf of Colleen Cicchetti, who is the executive director of our center. Um, who was not able to join us today. Um, so I, I don't wanna take too much time because I do want to encourage the Q&A. So I'm gonna give a high level overview and I'm happy to answer additional questions um, 
if, uh, through the discussion afterwards. But I, a couple things that we've been doing here in Illinois as, as a Center for Childhood Resilience. One thing that I think is really important is to know that um, the Center for Childhood Resilience sits within the um, Academic Medical Center um, of Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, and we are at Lurie Children's Hospital. So we are the largest um, pediatric hospital in the state. Um, and so I think that gives us a unique voice in terms of um, the kind of overlap of health, mental health, and then what's happening in education. And so one of the things that we have been able to do using that platform of Lori Children's Hospital is to really raise public awareness. And so um, we have really tried to gather those resources and really push them out in any way possible. Um, through our um, website, which you see down there below with resources for COVID-19. Um, we also had the opportunity to start to convene um, town hall meetings with key leaders, including um, we very quickly after um, the beginning of the stay-at-home order, Colleen Cicchetti and a, um, a youth presenter that we work with was able to host a youth town hall with our governor, J.B. Pritzker, to really talk about what are the questions that youth have. And so it was really youth facing. We're really trying to elevate the voices of um, children and youth, as well as community members, and really focus on access of resources and information by providing um, many languages as well. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, Sharon, this is a, a really busy um, slide here, but you can see some pictures of Colleen Cicchetti, our executive director with J.B. Pritzker, um, and our um, Mikva Challenge youth moderator as well. Um, we also had the opportunity for um, Dr. Rebecca Ford-Paz on our team, that's Lori Lightfoot, our mayor, for those who don't know her, um, to really talk about um, answering questions specifically for our refugee and immigrant um, communities and how can we support them. Next slide. So beyond public awareness, and again, I think that really trying to use this moment to, to raise the stakes so that we're raising all our voices, attention, we really wanted to use our um, advocacy platforms to um, really create lasting change. So not just looking at what is happening now in the response, but really how does this propel us to a new state with social emotional learning um, and trauma responsive practices and equity in all of the things that we are doing. And so we really are trying to increase um, awareness. So we have a number of active local stakeholder groups, which I will talk about in a, in a moment, but we really wanted to um, move to really step up and step in into those spaces as we're being asked to respond, to discuss. We have increased our frequency of our stakeholder group meetings. We've really been keeping our eye on what is the federal funding? How do we talk to our state board of education? How do we engage our teachers union and educational advocacy groups in our state? Um, we also have really been looking towards our philanthropic community and we're lucky in Chicago um, to have a very active um, philanthropic community. And I think one of the challenges is how do you extend that to other areas um, in our state and beyond where there may not be that. But um, we are speaking actively to funders that really wanna do something about this and step in to close budget shortfalls from state budgets and federal budgets um, as well. So if you go to the next slide, we can see some of our advocacy partners there. Um, we are um, really active in what's happening in Chicago. So there is, um, uh, Chicago is with you task force. It's a recovery task force and we're on the mental health committee of that. Um, Healthy Chicago 2.0 is an initiative pushed by our city um, department of public health um, that has included in its vision, um, both current in 2020 and then the, the previous version um, has included becoming a trauma responsive city in its, um, in its um, kind of goals. Um, the Illinois Childhood Trauma Coalition is a voluntary collaboration of organizations involved in um, childhood trauma. And so it, we have over 120 public, private, clinical and research um, institutions. Illinois Children's Mental Health Partnership is a um, entity that was put into law by the state statute um, in 2003 with the Children's Mental Health Act, and it's um, charged with creating and monitoring a children's mental health plan for Illinois. So we really have a number of entities that are existing in the state that we can kind of leverage and convene more frequently, more urgently um, to have these discussions so that really we're leveraging 
all of this to create lasting change. So we know that educators are gonna be faced with new challenges related to COVID-19. And I would say I made these slides um, and I should have included all of the inequities and the structural racism and the unrest that's happening now. And the, the we are hearing and we, we can't ignore any longer the need for looking at what it, does this impact have on stress and trauma? How can we um, look at the disproportionate impact for communities of color and those living in poverty? And so we really need to be prepared, preparing our educators, preparing our communities really to build this resilience as we go forward. And so we're talking about trauma-informed practices, policies, and procedures educator well-being and self-care, mental health awareness and intervention strategies, both for remote virtual as well as in-person, crisis response strategies, I know that we cannot underscore that enough, and psychological first aid. And really, the goal is for these strategies not just to be band-aids. We do need immediate tools, but we really also need to have something that we're leveraging that's gonna be sustainable over time. So how do we do that from a partnership perspective, from a funding perspective, um, and from a training perspective. So those are our kind of missions at the moment with our advocacy work. Um, and so we are really trying to um, build on existing efforts. I think um, Paul mentioned earlier that we were lucky to um, have been awarded along with the National Center for School Mental Health and uh, the Alliance for Inclusion and Prevention, this National Child Traumatic Stress Network um, Stress Initiative grant for five years to really build on these trauma responsive school frameworks and expand them. Um, and so we are really going to be working with our Illinois State Board of Education very um, closely on how do we provide educators and mental health professionals with those communities of practice so that they can learn from one another, they can engage, and we can really create lasting change both from the ground up and from the top down. And so those are the things that we're really focused on right now. And um, I think that this collaboration across sector is really what, what is gonna get us there. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tali, and to all of our speakers for outstanding content. We have a few minutes remaining to move to discussion. We've had some excellent questions come in, some of which have been answered in the Q&A box. So for those who may not have found that yet, it's a separate piece from the chat box and you can go in and see some of the already asked questions and answers. And I'm gonna go ahead and direct a few questions to our speakers. And we'll also invite all of our participants today to answer a few poll questions to give us feedback about how we did and how we could improve and other topics that we could uh, share with you in the future. So the first couple of questions uh, that came through when uh, we heard from John Crocker speak to the role of families in providing these universal mental health promotion supports in their home during COVID-19. So a couple of related questions, John, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, put yourself on camera if you'd like. The questions are, do you find that parents are willing to listen, relearn, or learn for the very first time uh, to be able to successfully achieve PBIS? That question came in from Jana. And relatedly, um, we had a question come in about the fact that parents are simultaneously experiencing tremendous stress load and some of their own mental health uh, stress and challenges. And so how do we kind of do the, expect them to do the promotion of social emotional health in their young people when they are navigating these uh, complex times as well? That's a great question or a series of questions rather. I think that Ultimately, uh, what I am seeing is that parents are very open to receiving some consultation and support because um, the alternative is that they're going it alone and that they're trying to figure it out on their own. So those conversations have been successful. Um, that being said, it is a balancing act. I think it's tough for parents who are experiencing their own level of stress and anxiety related to working from home and balancing remote learning to take all of that on. Um, so self-care becomes an incredibly important conversation with parents. I think the balancing act also has to be sensitive to the fact that not everything is going to work. Not everything is going to um, get completed from the standpoint of academics. We do need to be sensitive to 
the fact that um, well-being needs to be front and center with, with families and students, and that once that's established, then we can look at, um, at, at taking care of some of the other uh, tasks and, and responsibilities at hand. But, um, but before any of that can happen effectively, we need to focus on the well-being of students and families. So, um, so briefly, yes, I think that these conversations are going well because parents are in a particularly difficult situation. And in order to foster that and to make it stick and sustain, we have to ensure that parents have access to services and supports as well. In Massachusetts, we have uh, things like Mass 211 or behavioral health partnerships that are established across the state to be able to provide services and supports to families. Um, I would strongly recommend resource pages, uh, depending on the region that you're living in, working in, to be able to point parents in the direction of services and supports that they may need for themselves. Great, thank you so much, John. The next question I'm going to direct to both Tali and Paul came from Laura asking for any suggestions for reaching students who due to anxiety or other issues are having difficulty connecting through Zoom or other virtual methods. And I think this holds both for our tier one supports, but certainly also for our tier two, tier three supports. So Tali, Paul, any suggestions for reaching hard to reach students? Um, the, uh, I, I'll jump in and you can to jump in after Tali. I, I would suggest uh, for those kids to really be working with parents. Um, it frequently the issues that the students are facing are shared by brothers, sisters, parents too. Um, and so if you're really wanting to be teaching, say, um, self-regulation skills to kids, it's really helpful to be uh, starting with parents who can be then reinforcing that with their kids when, you know, in, in the meantime, when uh, between times you're meeting with the student. Um, and that all of the CBT work that you do, whether it's psychoeducation or relaxation or thought restructuring, those are all really helpful for, for all family members. And so if one particular student is having trouble connecting, maybe you can uh, get in uh, to the whole family and that will then so trickle down to the particular student that you're worried about. I would just add that understanding that the root of the problem with connection is really critical. So if it is in, indeed due to anxiety as you're talking, I think a lot of our CBT strategies that we that we already rely on can be used really nicely in the, in the virtual setting. And so gradual exposures and fear, hi fear hierarchies um, are really good tools to kind of figure out where they are, what's making them anxious, and how can we modify that? So maybe it's about them not being on camera the whole time. Maybe it's, you know, starting with a smaller group first. Um, maybe it's, you know, communicating by email and getting them comfortable that way. So thinking about different um, ways to modify um, the virtual platform so that they can be more comfortable and gradually start to um, become more comfortable and face that anxiety. If there are other barriers in the way, if there's, um, you know, I think some of the things that we've learned as we're convening groups is sometimes there's a chat feature and kids can say lots of things in the chat that might be bullying behaviors, for example. So we really want to meet with the student and figure out what is the, the source of the difficulty and how can we make sure that it's safe for them. Um, maybe there's confidentiality and privacy issues at the home. And so a lot of our clinicians have established signals, you know, they might do like something like this if they have some, if they can't speak freely or if they need to, to go off screen. So thinking about ways that we can really understand from the student's perspective, what are the barriers to engagement uh, and how can we help problem solve those? Wonderful. Thank you so much for those responses. We have uh, several questions coming in, and yet we are at the end of our time together. I want to thank again our speakers. I want to uh, especially acknowledge the humanist, uh, human quality that Kelly brought by having a toddler in the background, and I think it uh, made us all just recognize and appreciate uh, the layer of complexity that so many are uh, contending with in various ways. 
We will answer the questions that remained unanswered uh, in the resource guide that we will be sharing with you. I do want to mention there is another webinar next week where we will be attending to issues specific to planning for the 2020-21 academic year. It will be a week from now, uh, same time, same place, and we will uh, look to, you can look to the School-Based Health Alliance or National Center for School Mental Health for information about that. Thank you again to all of our speakers and to all of our participants uh, for joining today and look out for a recording of the webinar, the PowerPoint slides and all of the resources. Take care. <laughs>